Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 8, Non-Infectious Disease and Disorders. This is video number three. We're going to be focusing on adaptations in endotherms. So this is another one of these um, areas that has a lot of potential content in it. Uh, we need to investigate the various mechanisms used by organisms to maintain their internal environment within tolerance limits, including trends and patterns in behavioural, structural and physiological adaptations in endotherms that assist in maintaining homeostasis. So this is a big area, and obviously we can't cover this in a shortish video, otherwise it would go for hours. So we need to try and just focus in on a couple of the key points here and then obviously take these a little further in class. So hopefully adaptations is something that uh, you recall from your year 11 course. And so therefore you do already have an understanding of the difference between behavioral, structural and physiological adaptations. And that we can describe some specific examples that relate to um, endotherms in terms of maintaining homeostasis. What we're going to be looking at is specifically temperature regulation, uh, and we'll actually set that in the context of kangaroos, which are a species, uh, an Australian species, that actually a couple of which are found in desert regions where obviously temperature is going to be a really big factor. So we'll look at some of the adaptations that these organisms have. So move forward if you already know some of these things, but just to review adaptations, adaptations are characteristics that increase the survival and the reproductive chances of an organism in its environment. This is one of the drivers of natural selection. Of course, it's very important that we um, use language around adaptation very carefully. Um, sometimes the way that students can use this uh, in their answers can indicate more of a Lamarckian view that the organism itself adapted to the environment, made some sort of a change, as opposed to variation within the population that was then um, acted upon by particular selecting agents, which has made the occurrence or the frequency of those alleles more common in populations. When we're looking at adaptations, we're looking at three types of things. We're either looking at something the organism does, a behavior, or a particular structural characteristic. One of the easy ways to look at structural characteristics is to think about um, if I was able to dissect this, could I hold it in my hand, have a look at exactly what was going on here? Um, or physiological. So, and that is the way that the body functions. So I could look at um, the heart, for example, is a particular structure, but if a whole range of different organisms had hearts, but the way that the heart beat, the way that the heart distributed blood to the body changed under certain circumstances, then that would move it from being a structure into a physiology. One of the things that we do know is not, not the way that the heart beats changes, but certainly the blood vessels, particularly those close to the surface uh, of the skin, can change. They can um, constrict, get narrower, or dilate, get wider, and that can be reflected in the amount of blood that we see at the surface. So people looking pale during vasoconstriction uh, or with sort of reddish cheeks when we have uh, vasodilation. So that would be a structure, which is the blood vessels, but a physiology, which is that change that's actually happening in those blood vessels through vasoconstriction or vasodilation. So we put that one into the physiological bucket. So when we talk about homeostasis in relation to temperature regulation, we're talking about two main groups of organisms. Uh, ectotherms, uh, sometimes, um, I guess, not always correctly, um, going with the term poikilotherm, and uh, endotherms, which often also have the parallel term homeotherms. So a couple of different terms that you can have a look at um, for endotherms and ectotherms. So we're going to use those just for convenience. Um, and so that should separate a lot of the animal kingdom in particular into um, two nice neat groups based on whether or not the body temperature is regulated by the ambient temperature of the surroundings or whether it's um, regulated internally. So, and this is why it's a bit of a mis misnomer sometimes to talk about a reptile as cold blooded. If it's out in the sun and its body's warming up, it could be as warm as a warm blooded animal. Uh, so that's why we prefer to use terms that actually describe what's happening. Where is the uh, source of the heat? Is that coming from external or internal? Um, and how is that? Uh, what is the response based on? Is the response again based on something that's external 
or internal. So I may be an endotherm if I go out in the sun, obviously I'm going to absorb some heat from my surroundings, but hopefully my body is actually going to uh, have some strategies in place, some adaptations that are going to help me reduce that heat gain uh, and to uh, release some of that excess heat. So some of the general adaptations that we see in endotherms obviously is going to depend on whether they are in a very uh, hot environment or a cold environment. And this is where a strategy like vasodilation, dilation, uh, is something that is common in a hot environment because the extra blood flow um, helps in association with um, perspiration or sweating for uh, evaporative cooling. And that tends to happen in a very hot environment. Whereas in a cold environment, you want to try and, you're wanting to try and get all of that warm blood back into the key organs, the brain and the heart, for example. And so therefore you're going to go with vasoconstriction. So effective is a technique like this that when we look at ourselves, you can actually, your body will actually sacrifice extremities like fingers in really, really cold environments in order to pull all of that blood back towards those vital organs that are part of your, uh, the center of your body. So in extreme cases, we see that the same sort of strategies are going to continue to work. Um, and then hopefully when you're going through a list like this, you're doing two things. Firstly, you're looking at um, external covering of insulating hair or feathers. Is that something that is um, better for hot or cold or both? Um, and is this a physiology? Is it a structure or is it a behavior? So in each of these cases, um, part of what we're trying to do is to analyze the different types of adaptations that we see to determine whether they're uh, the adaptations that help the animal in a warm environment or a cold environment, or potentially in both, and whether they're a physiology, a structure, or a behavior. So large ears, for example, is a particular adaptation that we see. Um, often some desert animals will have this, which means we're talking hot environments, and large ears is a specific structure. So um, there would be a structural adaptation component to that. Now, in a, if, a, if in addition to large ears, there was a, a regulation of the blood flow to help with evaporative cooling, there might be a physiology associated with that. But the, the, the fact of large ears is something that we um, link back to one of our central concepts in biology, which is surface area to volume. If you want to uh, release heat quickly, uh, or absorb heat quickly, large surface area to volume is a good idea. Uh, if you want to conserve it, then you want a um, smaller surface area to volume. So uh, it's that surface area that's in contact where you have that large exchange taking place. So finally, let's have a quick look at the situation specifically as it relates to kangaroos. And if we think about kangaroos, two of the larger ones <clears throat> are the red kangaroo and the Euro. Both of these uh, tend to be found in, in very hot, dry environments, um, desert environments, uh, often associated with the center of Australia. And so these two are good ones to have a look at in terms of some of the temperature regulation strategies that they use. A lot of kangaroos um, lick their paws or their fur uh, and that encourages evaporative cooling. So it does it in the same way that um, sweat production on the surface of the skin does. And that's something that we do. We, we perspire. And um, that happens more for kangaroos, I guess, like us too, when they're exercising. Usually when they're uh, more inactive, they don't tend to have the same level of evaporative cooling through sweat production, they tend to use saliva more in that situation to help um, that process of evaporative cooling. So the idea is that as the liquid um, changes into a gas, that that process is actually absorbing energy, taking energy away from the surface um, and cooling the surface down. Red kangaroos may pant as well. Um, sometimes the panning actually happens with their mouths closed, so through the nostrils and Nostrils in there are going to have moist surfaces as well. So again, another way in which um, evaporative cooling can occur, moist, uh, can occur moist surface um, for that exchange of heat. 
Um, a behavioral kind of adaptation that we can find uh, for kangaroos is where, particularly if, and you can see the one in kind of the back of this slide sitting on the grass, uh, which is much nicer. If it had no choice in a desert environment but to lie down on the sand, you would know um, if you've been down to the beach in the middle of summer that the sand can get extremely hot, especially on the surface. So the kangaroos have learned to kind of sweep away that top layer to where it's a little cooler underneath before they lie down, uh, just to reduce that, that burning that can happen to them from that really hot sand. They are also smart enough to lie in the shade in the hottest parts of the day. They tend to be more active in the cooler parts of the day and try and get out of the sun uh, in the hottest parts of the day. And there's also a reflective aspect to their fur. Uh, you can see some figures of around 30% um, of the heat is reflected back. Um, so they don't absorb all of that energy that's coming in and striking their, their, their fur. This is just a small list of some of the adaptations that we can find and how we can categorize these into behavioral adaptations, structural adaptations, uh, physiological adaptations. Uh, and hopefully uh, when you get lists like this, you're already starting now to, to have a think about how you might classify each of these and how each of these can actually benefit the individual organism in helping to maintain homeostasis specifically in relation to temperature regulation. Thanks for watching.